when they wrote Watt. Uh, I, I don't remember those kinds of things very well. And it doesn't bother me that I don't. I wish I could, but I don't. I like to study those things so that at some point in time I, I know and I understand something about that. What I really want to understand is what God had put in the text. If I understand what the letter is about and the message that it's supposed to communicate to me, if I can't recall what town somebody was in when they wrote a letter, I, I think I'll get by. But I want to understand why the letter was written. What spiritual purpose did God have in mind? And so I hope that's what we always come to in the course of our study of the books of the Bible. I'm not saying that the other information is not important. I wouldn't say that at all. Uh, but I'm saying that you may be like me and sometimes get frustrated that you can't remember a lot of those details. And if you are, well, you're no different than I am, that's for sure. All right, everybody got a worksheet and we're ready to go. What we want to do at the beginning of this worksheet and beginning of this class is kind of go back and get the, uh, get the feel for 1 Corinthians, which, as you may recall, is actually the second letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, but there are only two that we have, and so 1 Corinthians... Is, uh, is what we're looking at right now to get the stage set for our study of 2 Corinthians. Those little funny looking two-tone arrows, by 110, Paul is addressing the problem of division. Do you remember that? Some saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas. Who was Cephas, by the way? Peter, the apostle Peter, that was Cephas. He was known by a, a couple of different names. So in chapter one, and verse 10, usually it seems like you're still in the greeting and the praise phase and stage and all that. Do we have enough worksheets? Are there any left? Are these extras? Here's some on the front. Mike, if you want to grab one of those. Right, there you go. Jake's got them. And if you'll see if anybody else needs one who's come in. Glad to have everybody this morning. We might have to go make some more. But it's significant to me that by the 10th verse of the first chapter of this letter called 1 Corinthians, Paul is addressing problems in the church and the first one is division. And then in chapter 3 verse 1, by the way in chapter 2 he's, he's sort of shoring up his authority as an apostle. Which tells me there were other problems in Corinth that they had doubts about his authority, his apostleship. There was somebody um, chipping away at his reputation and his credentials, which is always uh, an issue. But by the time we get to chapter three, he says that there are things he can't address because they are carnally minded. Keep that in mind about the church at Corinth. They're carnally minded, fleshly minded. Johnny, are you gonna make some more? Are you... Okay. Are you authorized to do that? You can, you can get into the office with clearance. Okay, good. Chapter 4, Paul's authority is questioned and he sets them straight. Chapter 5, verse 1, they've got an issue of immorality. You remember how he described that immorality? He said, this is something the Gentiles don't even do. Whew, that's pretty bad. But they had that going on in the church and he said they were even proud about it. And so he told them, you need to withdraw from this member who is committing immorality this way and staying in your fellowship, you need to withdraw fellowship from him. Chapter six, verse one, he's talking about disputes and lawsuits between brethren. He's condemning them for that and trying to get them straightened out. It says, even be willing to suffer fraud so that the Lord's church is not brought before the public courts and our dirty, dirty laundry aired out there, so to speak. Chapter eight, verse one, the church is admonished for practicing arrogant carelessness towards weaker brethren. Some who are uh, smart, I don't want to say smart enough, but who know enough, who are aware enough, are taking liberties that are causing other church members to fall. In this case, specifically eating meat that's been offered to idols. And it, it, this wasn't a case of them going up to an idolatrous temple and grabbing a hunk of meat off the altar. What would happen was 
animals would be sacrificed in various temples, and then those same animal carcasses would be taken down to the, to the shop, to the shambles, as it's put in the King James, and hung up for sale. And you go down there and you, oh, let me, I'll buy that goat there. And somebody else says, oh, don't you know that was sacrificed in a temple? Oh, okay, well then I, I won't eat it because you might stumble if I eat this meat that's been sacrificed to the idol. Actually, it's, what is it? It's a goat. It's just meat. You've got a right to eat it, but should you eat it? And that's what he's addressing. You're saying, well, I've got a right to eat this, and so I'm going to eat it. I don't care how it affects you spiritually. Those are the kinds of issues that were existing in the church in Corinth. People were arrogant towards each other. They didn't care what was going on with their brother. He even said in chapter 11, when you take the Lord's Supper, you don't even care about each other. They didn't have a nice communion set like we do with a bunch of cups and unleavened bread in a refrigerator back in the fellowship room. They, they brought their own stuff when they came. And some of them brought more than others. And they sat down and had a meal with theirs. And somebody else who was not very uh, affluent might not have anything at all. And so he says, you got a bunch over here, a little clique that's eaten to their heart's content. And they're, he used the word drunk. You're, you're drinking so much, you're getting drunk. That was, I think that's an expression of, uh, what am I looking for here? He was exaggerating. Nevertheless, that was the difference that they had, even when they took the Lord's Supper. Is there any time when we ought to be more spiritual and, and Christ-minded towards each other than when we observe the Lord's Supper? Seems to me that, that that ought to be the peak of the week right there. But that's how they were doing it. Chapter 15, verse 35. Somebody was questioning the resurrection so much that Paul even said, you fool. <laughs> it's interesting to me how he writes some of these things and he seems to give us insight into what's actually going on. And then the very, one of the very last verses, 16.22, he says, A curse on anyone who does not love the Lord. 1 Corinthians was a hard letter. It was written to a church that was weak, that was carnal, that was in division. And do you remember from last week's study, how long had Paul been in Corinth to get that congregation established up and running? Anybody remember? A year and a half. Yes. A year and six months he was there. So, can you imagine? You see in the United States, we go into a, a community and we convert people to Christ and, and we establish a congregation. Well, most of those people will probably have come out of some form of denominationalism. And if they haven't come out of some form of denominationalism, how many of them probably know about the Bible and Jesus Christ? Probably all of them in America, but we're talking about Corinth in the first century. There was no New Testament to be passed around for anybody to read. It was not on the bestseller list because it didn't exist at that time. And they certainly wouldn't have been reading the Torah, I don't imagine, because that was a Jewish book. Why, that's, that's why Paul went into uh, synagogues anytime he went somewhere because that would be the, the natural place to start. But once you go to the Gentiles, which he did in Corinth, You've got people who come out of heathen pagan backgrounds and have all kinds of strange worldly ideas and values. And so you can imagine what a mess the church was when it got started. What did Paul preach? Now he says this over and over in, in 1 Corinthians. He said, I, I determined to know nothing among you save, remember what he said? Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was his message to the church. And so whatever he taught in that year and a half, it, it's working, but it hasn't fixed everything. They weren't perfect like we are here at Choctaw. They had a lot of stuff to learn. You see my tongue and my cheek over here? That's... All right. Any questions about 1 Corinthians, that letter, or, or the congregation at Corinth? We're going to cover... Uh, these questions that cover chapters 1 and 2, but let's go ahead and read chapter 1 together first. 1, 2, 3. I need six readers. I need a, a reader for verses 1 through 4. 2 Corinthians 1 through 4. Who will take that? Jake. Uh, 5 through 8. Bonnie. 8 through 11. I can't see. Is that Sharon? Yeah. Oh, okay. I just saw a hand coming out behind Lisa's head. 
uh, 12 through 14 of chapter 1. All right, Doc's got that one. 15 through 19. Jenny, and 20 through 24. Last section of chapter 1. We'll do the same thing for chapter 2 when we get down there. Who's got the last uh, 20 through 24? Okay, Jim. Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 1 together, and then we will go over the questions. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raised us from the dead. Who delivered us from so great a death and does not deliver I mean and does deliver us in whom we trust. He will still deliver us. All if you all also helping together in prayer for us. For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world is simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshy wisdom, but by the grace of God, and more abundantly toward you. For we are not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand. Now I trust you will understand even to the end, as also you have understood us in part, that we are your boast, as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. In this confidence, I intended at first to come to you so that you might be right to your blessing, that is, to cast your way into Macedonia and again from Macedonia to come to you, and by you to be helped on my journey to Judea. Therefore, I was not facilitating when I intended to do this, or what I Thank you, readers. Paul begins the letter affirming that blank is with him as he writes. Verse 1, who's he say is with him? Timothy. Timothy. God's with him, yes. But Timothy's the one I wanted to point out here. Now, okay, that's a fact. What's the relevance of that? When I read First and Second Timothy, I, I try to imagine 
All right, Paul's writing to Timothy about his work as a young preacher. What congregations is Timothy working with? Con the congregation at Corinth is one of those congregations. So when you read First and Second Timothy, try to picture him perhaps working with this church here with all of its problems. And then it makes a little more sense perhaps when Paul writes to Timothy and says, let no man despise your youth. Because there were questions in Corinth about accepting the authority of Paul and those who were with him. All of this stuff goes together. It, none, of, none of these scriptures are islands unto themselves. They all fit in the larger picture. All right, I promise not to preach a sermon on every line of the worksheet. Remember that the Corinthians knew Timothy well because he and blank had come to Corinth from Macedonia to help Paul back in Acts chapter 18, verse 5. Anybody recall that or has anybody looked it up? Silas. Silas. Timothy and Silas came down from Macedonia. Later when Paul was in blank, he sent Timothy back to Corinth according to 1 Corinthians 4.17. He was in the city of Ephesus. Ephesus. Number two, in your estimation, why might the Holy Spirit inspire Paul to immediately begin writing about God as the father of blank and the God of all blank? What would go in the first line? Mercies, father of mercies and God of all Comfort. Okay, a quote out of the text. Now, I worded the first part of it so that you can't get it wrong. Because I asked, in your estimation, which means if you provide your estimation, okay, that's, that's your estimation. I can't say that that's wrong because you're the only one who knows what your estimation is of the situation. But in your estimation, why might the Holy Spirit inspire Paul to immediately begin writing about God as the Father of mercies and God of all comfort? Is there any connection with the previous letter? That God can be forgiving. Okay, God can be forgiving. What would he need to be forgiving about? How would that comfort the church at Corinth? Okay, you guys are messed up. You, if you repent, if you respond properly to the teachings and you repent, you're probably going to be feeling pretty upset. When you discover that you've done something wrong, don't you feel bad? If you don't, you need to worry about yourself. You should feel bad. There's a reason why God built guilt into circumstances in life. It's not to punish us. It's to help us not to go the wrong direction. And they likely had a lot of guilt. And specifically, as Sharon mentioned, I believe over this one person from whom they withdrew fellowship, apparently withdrew fellowship, because that's what it seems like happened as, as Paul continues writing this letter. All right, the, the last part of number two, what does Paul say is the purpose of being comforted in their affliction? That's right. If you're comforted, you can comfort others. But specifically, here's what he says. Because I, I, don't, I don't think this is insignificant when he says it this way. And sometimes I wonder if, if God's listening to our Bible classes and, and hears me say things. And he's like, oh, Marty. No, but it's okay. <laughs> They'll figure it out. <laughs> They'll realize you were off. But maybe I'm not off on this. But here's, here's what I'm pointing out. Uh, verse 4. Who comforts us all in all our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who were in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. That seems to me he's coming down pretty hard on. We're going to comfort others, not just in a general way, but we're going to comfort others who need comforting with the same comfort, the same comfort that we were comforted with. In other words, however God is expressing his love to us and showing us comfort, that's what we're going to pass on to others. Not just a general, oh, it, it's going to be okay, it'll be all right. No, give them something specific like God does us. Do you have any go-to passages when you hurt 
or when you're worried or when you're anxious, when life gets uncomfortable, are there any passages of scripture that give you hope and give you encouragement? I, I would like, this is what I would like, to ask that question and everybody go, oh yeah, yeah, me, let me, let me. Because I'd, I'd like for that to be a situation in everyone's life where I'm feeding on the word so much that I know exactly where to go when I'm hurting over this or over that. And we should realize that God wrote the scriptures for us that way. Paul's not just talking about some comfort that took place 2,000 years ago. He's writing to us about comfort that God provides and makes available on a daily basis, on a regular basis. If you haven't found it in the scriptures, keep looking, keep digging. Talk to me, talk to Dayton, talk to any of our elders about this, and, and we'll see if we can help you find some of those passages that you'll write down and put on your bathroom mirror or on your refrigerator or tape to your steering wheel, as long as it doesn't interfere with your driving. Dayton? <laughs> Right. And then the word affliction is yet another word, and that means basically pressure, oppression. And it can also mean distress, strain. Uh, so you can see different things happening to us, and yet these terms, uh, we find a solution for a lot of it in our relationship with God and with one another. Right. Uh, here's, let's just illustrate this a little bit, and, and you're in charge of your own illustration. Whatever position you have being seated, of course you can use your arms and everything to manipulate your, your Bible and, and your worksheet and all that, but just let your fanny sit there until it goes numb. How, we don't think about this, but how often do we change our position when we're sitting Change it a lot because you, oh, I'm not comfortable this way, and so you, you just shift a little. And it might just be a, a subtle movement of one leg, or you might cross a leg or uncross a leg. But I'll tell you this, if you sit the way you're sitting right now, no matter how comfortable you are at the moment, it won't be long before you go, you know, I'm not comfortable anymore. And when you feel that, when you understand that, what do you do? You make a change. You make a change to become comfortable. It's the same thing spiritually and emotionally. If you're not comfortable spiritually or emotionally, there's a reason and there's a way out of it. We can, we can search the scriptures. We can find out what God has said to encourage us. That's one of the words Dayton used in his definition of the Greek word. We can find ways to give ourselves the peace that God has provided. It's there. What do you... What? Yes. Remember Paul in prison Right. That's right. And it's just a matter of, of living deliberately. He, he chose to put his faith in Christ and to find the reasons to live with, with faith and hope. When you go stand in front of the pantry or stand in front of the refrigerator, you just open up the door. What are you looking for? Chocolate. Yes, you might have a specific in mind. Or you may not even know exactly what you're looking for, but you're looking for something because you, you, you want something. And you may not even know what it is, but you're looking. Imagine... Being in the, the biggest, most well-stocked grocery store in the world, you're going to find 
whatever you need to satisfy whatever hunger you've got. That's what happens when you open the Bible. You've got to find something there to help you spiritually, emotionally, mentally. It's in there. Just keep looking. If it's, if it's spiritual chocolate, God made those cocoa beans, did he not? Yeah. He wants us to enjoy everything he created, especially his word. All right, number three. Man, we're just... Racing right through these, aren't we? What two things does Paul say are ours in abundance? Sufferings and comfort. But what sufferings and what comfort? Suffering. What does that mean? We've got the sufferings of Christ in abundance. How do you suffer the sufferings of Christ? You get some wounds in your hands and your feet. Have somebody stick a spear in your side. Put some thorns on your head. Nick. In my oh, in your estimation. All right. Christ took on all sin. So that we so we can save us. Right? Uh, so every sin that we commit is a suffering of Christ. Okay. Okay, now you're addressing our own mental anguish over our own sin. Is that right? Uh, I mean, we, we just spoke to that person before about the healing that God created. Right. Right. Okay. Very good. When God made man, how did he do it? He, he took a handful of dirt, that's what he started with, and he formed the body, the flesh. And then he breathed into that life, or breathed into that flesh, the breath of life, and man became a, a living soul. So on one hand, we are people of flesh, and that flesh is of the earth, and that flesh desires the things of the earth. But on the other hand, we are of the spirit from God, and that spirit desires God. And our lives are constant struggles to control the flesh as it should be controlled and to have a relationship with God. And the flesh is constantly interfering with that. The flesh doesn't mean to interfere. It's just the flesh. It's, it's like a two-year-old. Mommy, 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 mommy. The two-year-old doesn't get up in the morning and say, I'm going to keep mom from getting anything done today. It's just a two-year-old. And we might think sometimes there's evil intent there. No, there's not. It's just a two-year-old. Your flesh is just your flesh. And you're always going to have your flesh until you die. Christ came. He never gave in to the lusts of his flesh, whatever they were. He always controlled the flesh. I'm not saying he didn't enjoy life. What aspects of life did he enjoy? Here's what Jesus enjoyed. And I can tell you this from from reading the gospel. He enjoyed every godly aspect of life. That's what Jesus did. He enjoyed every godly aspect of life. And tell me there's not a lot of godly aspects of life to enjoy. But he never gave in to the flesh. But he struggled. After he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, I like the way Matthew puts it. I always come back to this. He was hungry. It's like, duh, come on. You really got to tell us that. But the Spirit inspired him to say it. So, yeah, I need to hear it. He was hungry. You think Jesus wanted bread when Satan said, hey, turn these stones to bread? If he didn't want bread, then it wasn't a temptation. When he took him up on the pinnacle of the temple and said, cast yourself down. If he didn't want to do that, to try that out, to see if the angels would bear him up, then it wasn't a temptation. Jesus wanted to do that. He struggled against the flesh. When Satan showed him all the kingdoms of the world, he said, man, you can have all this if you just worship me. If Jesus didn't want to do that, if there wasn't some part of his flesh that wanted that, then it was not a temptation for him. But it was a temptation. But he fought that temptation. And the sufferings of Christ are... 
resisting all the things of this world that are going to pass away and embracing all the things of heaven that we cannot see with our eyes or hear with our ears or touch with our hands. What is the comfort in that? Or is there any comfort in that? Or do you, do you disagree? Do you think, ah, that's not what Paul's talking about? Is there any comfort in Christ? You gonna live forever? I, I see Dan. At first, Dan goes no, and then he goes, oh yeah. <laughs> and it's yes and no at the same time. No, we're not, not gonna live forever here. But who would want to live forever here in this body that's tied to this earth? I want to be free. And that's what God is going to do for us, and, and that's the hope that we have in Christ. And it's, it's a huge part of the comfort that I have of knowing that this, this body, even in its prime, was so limited and so what's the word? Well, think of yourself at your prime. Could you fly? Just jump up and fly. How much could you lift? I remember being so impressed with myself. I had a, I had a 900 Kawasaki. It weighed 506 pounds. And at one point, I deadlifted it because it fell over. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, wow, I can lift 500 pounds. Well, so what? I can lift 500 pounds. How much is 500 pounds speaking in terms of the universe? 500 pounds isn't very much. I can't fly. I can't even jump very high. I can't. What's the fastest you can run? How long can you go without sleep? How long can you go without food and water? We are so limited by these bodies. And how did I get off on this? Except that this is a struggle of the Corinthian church. They were carnal, fleshly minded. And the flesh is not going to make it. It wants us to think, if you just satisfy me, you'll be fine. That's what the flesh wants us to think. Just satisfy me and everything's going to be okay. Just feed me and give me sleep and give me sex and give me everything else in the world that I desire and everything's going to be fine. And our spirit is saying, I no, hmm, that's not going to work. That's the way they were at Corinth. Yes, Joe. Okay. Yes, and if you knew everything that you knew now, how could you relate to anybody who was 20 when you go back? That, that's what, you know, I used to think that, boy, when I get old, if I could just come back and be, no. I don't want, nothing against 20-year-olds. But, man, I'm, I'm beyond that now. I hope. All right. Uh, where are we here? Number four, how would you put the message of one, verses six and seven, succinctly? See, that's why I talked all that time, so you'd have time to think about this next one. Uh, how would you put the message of chapter one, verses six through seven, succinctly? How would you boil it down? If we are afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation, or if we're a comfort, it's for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer. And our hope is for you in this is, or rather, our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. What's that mean? I'm so comforted myself by the fact that when Peter wrote, he talked about Paul's writings and he said, in which there are some things hard to be understood. Oh. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for inspiring Peter to say that about what you told Paul to write because I don't understand everything that Paul wrote. And sometimes when I think I've got it, but I'll, I'll tell you this, in trying to understand what Paul wrote, I've never misunderstood anything Paul wrote in a way that led me in the ways of the world. Does that make sense? Yes. Their suffering, I, I achieve 
I get comfort knowing that they already went through that for me. Okay. And that um, when and I'm and I, I feel good when I know somebody that I care about is doing better. It makes me feel better. All right. There's a a relationship that we have that ties us all together. Just like when you when you hear bad news, something that's happened to somebody, you don't go, oh yeah, I didn't like them. I'm glad that happened to them. Nobody does that unless you're sick in the head. When you hear bad news, something happened to somebody, you go, oh, that's horrible. I feel bad. Even though I know they might have deserved it, I still feel bad. <coughs> Whatever thoughts you might have. Nobody wants to have evil, ugly thoughts about another person. And so when we have, when, when Paul recognizes you're, you're suffering, I wrote you a letter and I lambasted you guys. And you deserve that lambasting. You were doing a lot of stuff wrong. I've been there for a year and a half trying to get you spiritual and, and you're still carnal. And you've got a guy living in sin, sleeping with his father's wife, and you, you're proud of that. By the time they got finished with that letter, all the saints in Corinth were probably going, oh man, I didn't realize we were such horrible people. So he comes back and he says, the fact that you recognize all that stuff that I wrote to you was right and you felt bad and guilty, you're, you're suffering the sufferings of Christ. You are now facing the flesh and saying, I've got to stop this. Struggling with that. I'm comforted that you feel bad about it and repent. When you've got one of your children that's done something wrong and you're talking to them about that, have you ever had this? No, probably none of you have ever had this happen. But they don't think they did anything wrong. That, to me, was one of the biggest frustrations. How can I get them to see? And when I finally did get them to see, it was like, oh man, now they're crushed and they're hurt and they're suffering. And I was comforted by seeing their suffering because I knew by that suffering that they had connected with the truth. And I'm comforted by that as a father. And now that I'm seeing their guilt and their suffering and their agony over realizing what they've done, what does a father do? Now you embrace them. Now, now, loved one, do you see what you've done? Do you understand? And I want you to know that what you've done doesn't change our relationship at all. I don't love you any less than I did before. This suffering thing is extremely important. It's vital that we suffer in Christ, for Christ, and recognize that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Questions, comments. Phil? We're comforted when the, when the lost are baptized or restored. That's right. When the lost see that they're lost, they understand that and they do something about it. What a great comfort it is. When we announce on a, on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, huh, so-and-so obeyed the gospel, what do we do? We're amening, we're clapping. Because that's fantastic news. Number five. Yes. That's right. And when our relationships are the way that they should be, that, that's the way it will be. You know as well as I do that sometimes you've had to go and help somebody and you, and you thought, oh great, I had something better to do and I've got to go do this. You also know that there are times when somebody's called and said, oh, i, I got an issue, can you help me? And you drop everything no matter what it is and you go and you don't even think of that as a chore. What's the difference? The difference is your relationships to those two different people. 
Some, it's a chore and it's a duty. Others, oh, it's a, it's a, I'm just glad you called so that I could come and help you. And they said, I'm sorry you had, oh, don't, don't apologize. I'm glad you called me because this is the kind of relationship I want to have with you. I, I don't know why we can't have that kind of relationship with everybody. It seems like we struggle with that, but aren't you glad we have that relationship with some? Wow, we've already had a bell. Number five, notice how Paul relates to the Corinthians a recent affliction he and his traveling companions endured in verses 8 through 11 of chapter 1. He says, we were, oh, we were blanked excessively. Anybody got that? Burdened, Burdened excessively beyond blank blank. Our beyond our strength. We despaired even of life. We had the sentence of death. Well, Lord willing, we'll come back next week and complete this one and have another one to work on. Maybe I won't preach so much next week. Thank you.